for the grace of the Lord. He's so very good to us, and I'm grateful. You say, well, preacher, this world's pretty rough. We don't have much to sing about. If you're saved, you can sing about the amazing grace of the Lord, and I'm so very thankful for God's amazing, amazing grace. Turn with me, if you would, tonight to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. <clears throat> I was reading a little bit and uh, come across these verses, and it, uh, they're familiar verses. We've, you've heard them preached on, you've heard them preached about, you've heard them referenced. And uh, <clears throat> But I do want to share with you what I believe the Lord's placed upon our hearts for tonight. Once you find your place in Hebrews chapter number 10, I'd like to invite you to stand and honor the reading of the Scriptures. Aren't you glad for your Bible? Amen. Aren't you grateful for the Word of God? We can find hope uh, in hopeless times. You can find it in the pages of Scripture. And I'm so very grateful that the Lord's given us His Word. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 23, He says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approach. Amen. Thank you tonight for standing. You can be seated. <clears throat> we often hear things like this, you know, you know the, the golden rule, right? Do unto others is it's not before you'd have them do unto you. It's do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, we, we use, or, or how many of you have heard the acrostic, and I know you have, about joy? You know, Jesus, others, and you. And we use those things, and, and both of those ideas, if you would, express the, the very idea of helping and investing in others. One of the, one of the lessons that, I've been, that I taught in uh, our uh, young adult Sunday school class was about uh, the investment in people. When you teach, when you're leaders, uh, you invest in people, you invest in other people. Uh, we would say things, you know, it's not all about you and uh, things of that nature. And so when, when you come, we, we're familiar with these phrases that deal with helping or deal with investing in others. And the latter portion about the Jesus, others, and you, the latter, it really insinuates that we can find joy or that joy is found, obviously, in placing Jesus first. I'd say that's a pretty good place for anybody to start. If you're looking for joy, put Jesus first in your life. If you're looking for joy, put Jesus ahead of your wants. If you're looking for joy, put Jesus ahead of your thoughts. If you're looking for joy, put Jesus ahead of your job. If you're looking for joy, put Jesus ahead of society. We understand that joy begins with Jesus. All right, but then there's also a, a, a principle behind that. It's insinuating that joy is found not only in placing Jesus first, but it has to do with placing others before yourself. Well, how about this one? It's better to give than to receive. Now, I didn't fully appreciate that till I become a parent. I've heard people say that, and most of the time, it just sounds like something neat to say, but people don't really mean it. How many, how many Chevrolet people are in here? Chevrolet people. How many Ford people? How many don't care as long as it's paid for? Amen. <clears throat> Brother, if I was to walk up to you, and I was to say, Brother Darrell, you got a, I, got, I got a choice for you. I'm either going to hand you the keys to a brand spanking new 2021 GMC Denali. Regular cab. I mean, uh, extended cab, for, king cab, a quad cab. I'm going to give you the keys to it. It's going to be paid for. Or you can turn around and give that to Brother Terry. Now, spiritually speaking... You're going to say, well, brother, I, I probably, don't, probably don't deserve that. But my flesh, I can tell you what my flesh would want to do. My flesh would say, brother, Terry's already got a pretty nice truck. That's what my flesh would say. Now, we laugh about all, okay, we, we carry on about that. But when you have children, you know, when you were little, you didn't think about what, what you bought your parents. You thought about for Christmas what your parents is going to buy you. But as you get older, you find out there is genuine joy in investing in somebody else. There's joy in those things. You say, well, preacher, I don't understand. Well, keep on. One of these days, maybe you'll get there. But investing in other people, we can find satisfaction in life in putting someone else above ourselves. Investing in other people. Uh, Time.com, Time Magazine, their, their online version, uh, quotes a Chinese saying, it says, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. That's pretty good. I don't care if it did come out of Time Magazine, that's pretty good. And I don't care if it did come from China, it's still pretty good. 
<clears throat> if you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. Now, I want to say this. While it's nice to help one another, I also wanted us to see that it's needed to help one another. Now, oftentimes when we think about something that's needed, we think about, well, I'm, being, I'm, I'm needed, so I, they need me to help them. It's as much needed for me to help them as it is for them to help, for me to help them. I don't know if that come out right. In other words, when people need help, you need to help them as much as they need your help. It's necessary for both parties. And so when we look at these things, the Bible here is talking about, when you look in context of Hebrews chapter number 10, the Bible is talking about what it means to live the new life in Christ Jesus as believers. Uh, you see, there's a pull, there's a struggle between the law and between grace. We don't have time to go back and take a historical review of the book of Hebrews, uh, but we see there's a lot of things that's better than if you go through the book of Hebrews. Uh, but our salvation is better than the law. May I tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice is better than the blood that was shed by bulls and goats. I'm telling you, he, he laid down a sacrifice once and for all and for all men. We have a better sacrifice. But he's talking about living the life. It's a better life to live in grace as it is under the law. Now, as we look at these things, uh, as we talk about the sacrifice of Christ, it tells us that it affords us some blessings. Because we're saved, we, it, is a, it has afforded us an opportunity to come before the throne room of God. Look at verse number 19. Having therefore, how's it therefore? Because of that sacrifice where there's been an offering for sin named Jesus Christ. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. And so he's talking about a relationship that we now have for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. We've been saved. All right, and so it's in this context that he gives us three of these let us sayings. Let us draw near, verse 22. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith in verse 23. And verse 24, let us consider. Now I'm going to talk about this just for a minute. We'll get into the message. Hold fast our profession. When he says that, it does not mean that they're holding on in hopes that they will not lose their salvation. That is not what Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 23 is talking about. We're not, aren't you glad, child of God, we're not going through this life trying to hold on to something we never got by our own merit? Listen, if we could lose it, we'd lose it. If, we, if I could physically lose it, I'm telling you right now, I'd lose it. Say why? I fail Him every single day. Every, I don't say that with arrogance, nor do I say that with pride, but I fail Him every single day. And if I could lose it, I would lose it. I can promise you this, I'm not trying to cling to the salvation. I'm not, we, we sing, I will cling to the old rugged cross, but we're not clinging there for salvation, my friend. I, once you're saved by the grace of God, you're always saved. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. And so when he said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, he's not talking about holding on to your salvation. Many in the Bible, man, many in the Bible were living in days where religious leaders of the time were trying to incorporate the law back into salvation by grace. The Judaizers, they, man, the Jews struggled with this. The Hebrew people struggled with this because their leadership, they were trying to merge law and grace. May I say there can be no law and there can be no grace mingled together. It's either law or it's grace when it comes to our salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The, the Bible teaches us that the law could not save. The law could not remove sin. All right, but there was, a, there was a struggle, and you'll see that in several different letters that was written in the epistles. There was a struggle about the law trying to be remingled with grace. You know, in other words, it's like this. They were living in a society which was trying to shake their profession. It was trying to shake where they stood. It was trying to cause them to, to waver and to kind of go back on what they initially placed their faith in. Again, they can't lose their salvation. They're saved, sealed into the day of redemption. But their society, their world was trying to incorporate law back into grace and there was a pull and a push to return to this living the life under the law. And the Bible says here, as I believe Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews, he said, let us hold fast our profession. 
without wavering. Without teeter-tottering. It means to be firm or unmoved. May I say in a changing world, it's still Christ and Christ alone that's our hope. It's not my good works. As I go, listen, my, my hope for eternity is not based on my good works, my good deeds, or my, my good name. It's based on Jesus Christ and on Him alone. In the midst of this conflict and the draw of the world around, Paul says this now, to consider one another. To consider one another. Uh, we live in a society that's a me and mine type of society, isn't it? It's a me and my type of society. I saw this today, read it, somebody posted it, it might not be funny, but he said a guy had pulled up to a, some of y'all may have seen it, you'll, you'll know the guy posted it, he said one guy pulled up to the corner and there's a homeless guy holding a sign, I said this could be you, and he said so I put my dollar back in my pocket because I thought he might be right, y'all will get that later, I said preacher you ought not laugh about that, y'all get that later. <clears throat> We live in a me and my type of society. Y'all can laugh a little bit. It's okay. Put a smile on your face. It won't hurt it, I promise. Some of you might crack your face a little bit, but it won't hurt for long. But we live in a me and a my society. What's best for me? What's best for my family? What's best for my needs? What's best for my agenda? What's best for my lifestyle? And yet here, Paul says to consider one another. Let us, those of us who have been birthed in the family of God by this better sacrifice, by this better way, by this better high priest, by this better blood. Hey, those that's been birthed in the family of God, he said, let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. There's a pull, if you will, in society to get believers to stop being so judgmental. Don't, don't be so judgmental. Don't, don't be so judgmental. Listen, let me, ask you, let me ask you this way. How many of us, and I, and I promise I'm going to get to my message. My message will probably be quicker than my introduction. But I got five extra minutes because we didn't say in congregation. <laughs> How many of us can think about at least one family who at one time, they were faithful to the house of God? At one time, they were involved in the ministries of church. At one time, they sat maybe where you sat, somewhere in a church building, maybe not this church building, but in a church building. At one time, they sung the hymns. Matter of fact, they know them by heart. Didn't need a song book. At one time, maybe stood in a choir loft somewhere. At one time, and made a profession of faith and was ushered through a baptist baptistry somewhere, maybe a river, and had been, been baptized believers. At one time, maybe taught a Sunday school class, maybe worked with young people. Now think about it for just a minute. I'm not talking about a fly-by-night family. I'm talking about somebody who is what we would call plugged in. I mean, you thought, man, if there's ever anybody that loves the Lord, it's this family. And somewhere, maybe in the last five to ten years, maybe that family that's on your mind right now has somewhere along the line dropped off and now they're dropped out. Think about it for just a minute. You say, what have they done? They've wavered. Something pulled them in their standing. And they've now uh, seemingly not just dropped off, but they seem like they've walked away from everything. Social media tells on people. You say, why is that? Because now all of a sudden they'll start with they'll start with little things, just little four letter words here and there in their social media posts. And then it'll come to what they're involved in socially by their activities and what's in the background of what they're posting and things they're partaking in. And You say, what are you saying? I'm telling you, there's one time, that there's people who are one time what we would call pillars in the church and now they've just walked away seemingly from all. What happened? Something pulled. Something pushed. There was a draw in there somewhere. Now again, our society would say, listen, Christian, you need to stop being so judgmental. You need to stop being so dogmatic. You need to loosen up and to live a little bit. I want to throw this out there at you. I'm all right with living a little bit. As a matter of fact, I think every now and again, it would help us to loosen up a little bit, put a smile on our face, and actually enjoy the life that God gives you to live. We don't have to be mad at everything all the time. Listen, there's some things not worth fighting about. 
They some things that's not worth fretting about. They some things, and just because you believe a certain way don't mean you're always right or that I'm always right. Why is it that God's people got to be miserable? We think, in order, we think that godliness is misery. It's not that way. Listen, enjoy your life. But listen, when it comes to biblical matters, when it comes to a Christian walk and a Christian life, listen, there is no room to back up. There is no room for compromise. There, there is no room to go back on the salvation that God's given us and to walk away from the salvation that God has saved us in. You say, well, stop being so judgmental. Turn with me if you would. Man, i got to hurry. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. If you get the Song of Solomon, go back one. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. Now, I'm, I'm talking, we're, we're talking about helping people, and I've kind of been running a, a little rabbit here in a minute, kind of get scattered, but I'm going to try to tie it back in. You see, in a world where so many people are seemingly walking away, in a world, and I'm talking about church people, good people. Look at me, saved people. Saved, you say, preacher, I don't believe a saved man can walk away. Oh, yes, he can. Oh, absolutely, he can walk away. You say, well, preacher, what are we supposed to do? Why is it so important that we consider one another? We use this ver these verses oftentimes in weddings. Y'all ever watch them tie the ropes in weddings? You know, they'll do the, 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 the knot tying part of the service. I don't know. Some people light a candle. Some people tie a knot. Some people, I mean, they're tying a knot one way or the other. But they'll take these cords and, you know, one cord for the husband and one cord for the wife and one cord for the Lord and they braid them cords while somebody's over there singing a pretty song. And the preacher got to stand over there. I got to tell y'all a preacher story one of these days. I learned I wasn't the only oddball. But anyway, they're over there tying this knot. Why do they do that? What, what precedence do they have? And we talked about how the three-stranded three, three -stranded cord is not easily broken, talking about cord for the husband, cord for the wife, and keep Christ in the center of your home. But don't miss the crux of what the passage in, in and of itself is dealing with. Now, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, verse number 9, the Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Why, preacher, is two better than one? For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then that they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, what's it talking about? It's talking about helping and strengthening one another as believers. Helping one another. Another, the precedent that's set forth is helping. I want to preach on this thought tonight. We need all the help we can get. That's profound, ain't it? We need all the help that we can get in the day and hour in which we live. We've heard people use the phrase, and I hope tonight we can see the value in helping and strengthening each other. And I want to look at a few things back in our text of Hebrews chapter number 10 this evening. I want to look at a few things that deal with and how it will directly impact our helping of others. I want to look at its need, why and how we're to do it, because if we're not careful, listen to this, and deliberate in this area, we can neglect something so vital in our Christian walk. You know, when, when, we, when we do something deliberately, we do it on purpose. We do it on purpose. We go out of our way to do it. We make, it becomes a priority. I think sometimes that we forget that we are to be deliberate in helping one another. But I believe in the message tonight, if the Lord will help us, we can see that we all need all the help that we can get. The first thing I want us to look back in, in verse number 24 that's found in our text of Hebrews chapter number 10 is I want us to look at the purpose of considering one another. When the Bible says consider one another, it literally means to look, to fix our eyes upon and to look steadfastly at. It means to really genuinely look. It's hard to see people who need help if we're not paying any attention to them. You ever been walking? You ever saw? Yeah, have you ever spotted someone that needs help? And there might have been fifteen people walk by this person, but you're the one that noticed that they needed help on the highway. Now you ain't supposed. Don't ever text and drive. But now you, there's a lot of states that are like hands free. 
But be honest with yourself. Anybody ever been on the phone and totally drove past somebody, didn't even pay attention, they just broke down? How many cars you ever see? Now, here's my pet peeve. Uh, anybody ever seen a police officer drive by people, somebody sitting over there? Now listen, I don't know their agenda. They're busy. They, they got stuff to do. But in my mind, they're here to protect and serve. You know, now if I'm speeding, they're there to ticket and catch me, all right? But you know, they've got a thousand things to do. And I, and I understand that. I'm not throwing off on our law enforcement officers. Don't miss out on that. But here's somebody that, that's broke down the side of the road on 85. There's 10,000 people. <laughs> you know, most of the time, we're over there trying to get in the fast lane so we don't get held up because we're busy. And unless we deliberately set in our mind, now by the way, if you're a lady in here, I would not encourage you to stop and help anybody. You keep driving. There's crazy people in this world. Okay, there's crazy people. If you're a teenager in here, you keep driving. So they got cell phones. There will be an officer come along shortly. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But it's so easy to just... <laughs> and to keep driving. Why? Because we're caught up in what we do. The same holds true in our Christian walk. If we don't do it deliberately, if we don't do it deliberately, we'll never make time to do it. So what's our purpose for helping each other? Now, I will say this because the Bible said, let us consider one another. The purpose in helping meet someone's need or help is not so that we can feel better about ourselves. Why did you do that? Well, I feel better about myself. Well, that's wonderful. But unfortunately, I'm not preaching about the power of positive thinking. I said before, it ain't all about you and it's not all about me. It's not what. Now, granted, when we help people, does it result in feeling better about ourselves? Sure. I mean, and, and by the way, unless you're just a cold-hearted, low life, you, it's probably going to make you feel better about yourself. But that's not why we do it. That's kind of like giving an offering, hoping somebody will see how much you give. Now, don't quit giving your offering. Just get your motives right. Just get your motives right. But the purpose in helping people and considering one another, the purpose of this is very simply to provoke one another. The word provoke here is an interesting word. It's used two or three times in our King James Bible. It's found one time in the book of Acts. Now, this is certainly not it, but you remember when Paul, it has to do with something that is sharp. In, in, in the book of Acts, you remember when Paul and Barnabas had a little spat? As a matter of fact, they had a big one. They had a falling out. They was upset. They were both said, I am right on this matter, and I am not budging. It was over taking John Mark with them on the next missionary journey. They were fighting over taking somebody to the mission field. Can you fathom that? I can't. They were arguing about taking, I'm taking him. I'm not taking him. Yes, you are. No, we're not. We're not taking him. Yes, we're taking him. No, we are not. And the contention was so sharp between them. All right, that's the first word this word provoke means. Now, obviously... That is not what it means to provoke someone here when we come to Hebrews chapter number 10. It's also, it's a word that's sharp. It means to incite something. It means to nudge someone, if you would. And when we come to this portion of, of time, uh, because the first word's an irritation, this is not an irritation, this is an, is, 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 <laughs> this is an inciting. It's to urge somebody or to push somebody or to help someone along the way. It's fixing our attention to others to help them to live a particular way in light of the world that would draw them the other way. Now let's put this into to a common narrative. This world is so trying to pull and to bite and to devour and to tear and to rip down and to destroy God's people that God's people ought to consider one another that we might, instead of allowing them to be drug off and to be drugged down and to be pulled away, we ought to push them and incite them and to provoke them that they're able to live that Christian life that God's called them to live. Provoke them in two areas. He said, first of all, provoke them unto love. Provoke them unto love. We want to assist people into holding fast without wavering, right? I don't want to see people fall. I don't want to see people that used to sit on these pews all of a sudden out running wild with the world, destroying the name of Christ, 
destroying and ruining their families? Are you listening to me? I don't want that. That's, that's not what I want for anybody. You say, well, preacher, what if, what if somebody can't always come to this church? Well, listen, I hate that they can't always come to this church, but my desire is not that they just get out of church so we can talk bad about them. They can get in another church, get in a local assembly, leave the right way. Leave the right way. Don't split a church. About just leave the right way. Still love Jesus. We're not enemies one with another. Sometimes people just got to go. Some people, that's fine. But don't get out of the house of God. Don't sacrifice your family for those things. And that's not my desire for anybody is to watch a family collapse, to watch their family spiritually destroyed over carnality. That's not my desire. And I want to strengthen them. I want to help people. I want people to help me. I'm made of the same stuff you are. I can fall just as easy as you can. Anybody that walks away from their relationship with Christ is going to fall. I don't care what title or position they have. Provoke them unto what? Provoke them unto love. This is used here. It's referencing love from mankind to other mankind. That's an agape love. It's a God we're love. I believe Brother Robert mentioned this word in his message last Wednesday night. But here it's a love that man has toward other man, that mankind has to other mankind. In other words, the reason that I'm considering one another is because we love one another. That's not deep. That's not hard to grasp. You know, you want the best for the people that you love, don't you? How many of you want the best for your children? How many want the best for your grandchildren? How many of you ever, ever made a bad mistake because you really wanted the best, but you just maybe didn't want God's best? And all of us have. All of us have. But we want the best for our family. We want the best. Why? Because we love them. I think God's people ought to want the best for God's people. You know, sometimes a preacher has to preach difficult messages. You know why? Because he loves them and he wants the best for them. It's not always about feeling good. It's not always about being popular. And it's not always about being warm and fuzzy. Sometimes the best is the truth. Always the best is the truth. All right. But let me give you this. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. He said, consider each other to provoke each other to love each other. That's what he says. Consider, let us consider each other. Those of us who've been born again. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for, God, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. You see, brotherly love is a biblical concept. He said, listen, let's consider each other. Let's consider that my brothers and sisters in Christ are being pulled every which way from this world. Let's consider one another, hey, that our world is, is trying to bite and devour and trying to get people to go back upon their, uh, upon their profession that they've made in Christ Jesus. They're trying to get people to walk away from the priorities of that profession. Hey, listen, let's provoke one another to love each other more, to help each other more, to support it. I'm going to need all the help I can get. And so do you. Where are we going to find that help? Let's love one another. You can actually refer back to 1 Corinthians 13 about the priority of this love. If I have all the gifts that God can bestow upon a man, but I have not love, I'm a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. We're nothing without brotherly love. We're nothing without Godward love toward our fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only are we to provoke them into love, but unto good works. Works literally means are the toiling or, or that, that which we do with our hands, that which we do with our labor. One writer says this, it's beautiful by reason of purity. Good works are works that are beautiful by reason of purity of heart and life. Hence, they're praiseworthy, morally good, and noble. That ought to define the work of God's people. Morally good and noble. Morally good and noble. You realize that it is the, the very fulfillment of who we are as a believer to perform good works in our life. James said, show me thy faith without thy works and I'll show you my faith by my works. For faith without works is dead. It's useless. I'll tell you something, child of God. It's time that this world sees God's people as workers of good. Doers of good works. Listen, it, we've got to get out of our compound mentality. You say, preacher, what's a compound mentality? That means we're going to lock ourselves in the church. Well, we can't close the windows in here. We're going to lock ourselves in our church and we're going to huddle together like a little cult. We're going to sing our little songs and pray our little prayer and we're going to keep every, we're going to keep enclosed and shut off from the world. Listen, can I tell you something? God called us unto good works. If you're going to make, now listen, I'm not telling you to be ignorant or foolish. 
I'm not telling you to go run with the world, act like the world, look like the world, sound like the world, think like the world, talk like the world, behave like... That's not what I'm telling you. I'm going to tell you something. God called us to make a difference in this world, and the only way you're going to do it is if God's people start working good works. We start doing morally good things. Things that God has called us, those pure things, those things that are pure of heart. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We were created for that purpose. We were made into a new man for the purpose of the good works of God being performed in our life. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Titus 2.14, the Bible says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of what? Good works. Good works. Most people remember and influence people not by what they say, but by what they do. There's a lot of people that I remember that I may not be able to tell you a profound statement. I may not have a, a book of quotes that I can go back and refer to on this day, but I can tell you what, I can tell you what they did for me. I tell you what they did in my life. There's, there's preachers, I don't have it in this Bible, but I've got, I've got quotes that's written down by different men. Preachers of the pastors that I've had over the years. Been to a, to a conference. I've got, I've got notes in there from, uh, from Brother Barker. I've got notes in there from Brother Gibson. I've got uh, notes in there, things that Brother Bobby Robertson have said. I've got, I've got notes, just things that I've jotted down on the back of my Bible. People that said this quote or that quote. But there's people in my life who I don't have a quote jotted down on the back of my Bible, but those people shaped my life and made a difference in my life. We'll shape more people's life by the works we say rather than the word, by the works that we do rather than by the words that we say. Our good works. Again, James 2, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I'll show you my faith by my work. See, so people, preacher, how, how can the world know that we're saved? Live like it. Work like it. Walk like it. You don't have to go to the workplace and get up on your pop crate and preach and tell everybody how wicked they are and sorry they are. And they're going to hell. You say, preacher, well, it's the truth. It might be. But why don't you show them your faith with your works? Why don't you allow them to see what it means to be a child of God? What a Christian looks like on the job site? What a Christian sounds like on the job site? Why don't you try to show them how a Christian raises their family and has their priorities in a certain order? Not because you're looking down upon them, preaching to them, but show them your good works. And you'll help them that way. By the way, child of God, let's consider one another so we can provoke each other. To, to love, to love the brethren. Provo hey, listen, do good work. Say, preacher, we're going to browbeat them until they get right. Look up here. I can tell you right now from a, from a pastor's point of view, it ain't going to work. And you can browbeat them all day long. Some of the most miserable times as a pastor I've ever had is trying to get people to do what they're supposed to do. You know what I figured out? I can't make you do nothing. That's not good English. No, but it's right preaching. Let me give you one other one. You can't make me do nothing either. Yeah, we can, preacher. We'll stop paying you. This means I'll be hungry doing it, but I'll still do what I want to do. Now listen, let me tell you something. If all we ever do is browbeat people, I'm, I'm, I'm for preaching against sin. Do not misinterpret what I say. I think I have a biblical and a moral responsibility to stand up and take the Word of God and preach the whole counsel of God. And if it's sin, I have a God-given command and commission to preach against sin. And if it, if, listen, the chip's got to fall where they may, if you're guilty of it, then that's between you and God. I'm not talking about watering down our message. I'm not talking about changing our ministry. I'm not talking about stopping preaching the truth. You know me better than that. that's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, people, God's people, we need to help one another because we love each other to do right, to love each other. Hey, if we fall, get back up. Galatians chapter number 6 principle and encourage one another and help one another. There's a world that's trying to destroy us and get us to fall. Listen, I need all the help I can get. And the, the purpose of it. What about the place of it? The place of it. How many times have you heard verse 25 mentioned or preached in your Christian life? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Here we go. I knew a preacher was going to say something. I missed Sunday and I knew here it comes. Not forsaking. I know. Yada, 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 yada. But you know, I've, I've used it a whole lot. I'm going to tell you something. I think there's a biblical precedence to use it. It's not in there by accident. But let me share this with you. We oftentimes use this verse as a broad platform to where preachers or Sunday school teachers can just rebuke people for not coming to church. 
Stay with me. Don't, don't leave yet. Now, I will say the principle is there. But I do believe if we're not careful, we'll miss the purpose for which we assemble. We'll miss the purpose behind why do, why do we come together? Because the preacher says I have to or he's going to preach about me. That's not why. Do we understand the preciousness of what it was like to assemble in the early church? Have you ever took just a minute to think about what it meant to assemble? Over, over the last four or five months of this, whether you call it craziness, whether you call it nonsense, whether you call it cautiousness, whatever you want to call it. But I tell you, I, I've learned in my 46 years something I never thought I'd learn. I would learn, that I, I've learned that, listen, this thing about coming to church whenever we want to and however we want to, we better not just get the mentality that it's always going to be that way. This thing about, well, we've got, we've got freedom of assembly and freedom of religion. Somewhat. But we better stop taking this stuff for granted. Are you listening to me? I'm not, I'm not here to preach a gloom and doom gospel, but I want you to understand, we haven't even entered into what it was like in these days to assemble. Societies hated them. Families disowned them. They, they walked. I mean, they were they were they were literally outcasts. Their community. And the only fellowship they had was when the assembly come together. They weren't they weren't going to, to to houses on the afternoon and fellowship with their family and talking about the goodness of the Lord because God had changed their life and done a drastic work in their life. They were getting baptized, and that baptism was equaling uh, listen persecution for their faith. And so they, for one, they got together and assembled with other people who were going through the same stuff as they were. Maybe we need to think about that the next time it just gets so easy. To, well, I'm not going to come tonight. Well, I'm just not going to do this today. No, listen, the reason it said not forsaking it, he says because we need it. You see, it was, it was the place to which that provoking had an avenue. That provoking unto love, that provoking, provoking unto good works had an avenue. Look what he says. He said, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner or as the custom of some is. The place. As, as we look at the significance of this place, the goal of this passage is to help other people, to receive the help from others, to provoke us unto love, and to get, where can it happen at? It can happen at the house of God. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful when I can come to the house of God and my spirit is provoked to good works. When something that's said, something that's mentioned, a song that's sung, a special that's sung, a testimony that's given, hey, listen, causes me to get over the gloom and doom of the, of the week or the gloom and doom of the day or to separate me from the troubles of this world and it refocuses my attention upon Him and upon the goodness of God and it sparks within me to keep on one more day, one more hour, one more week, one more year and it provokes me into those good works. I'd miss all that if I wasn't here. I was talking today, I believe I was talking to Miss Jane on the phone. You know, you can get a lot off the internet, you can get a lot off the radio, but there's nothing like corporate worship with God's people. There's nothing like being in the house of God. There's nothing like hearing the testimonies of the saints of God, seeing the faces of the people. We need human interaction. God's people need to interact with other of God's people that we may go forward. Where do we get that from? It's in the assembly. It's in the assembly. Man, we live in a world that's trying to do everything they can to do away with the assembly. Oh, I can listen at home. I've heard this. Now, I'm, I'm, granted, listen, there's some that can't assemble. Most of the crowd that can't assemble longs for the day when they could. The ones that I've talked to that physically are unable will say, Preacher, I miss it so much. Weeping on the other end of the phone, weeping on the end of the couch, saying, I, I miss what I, I so wish I could come. I'm telling you, they're out there. And those of us who are healthy oftentimes, well, you know, I got this, or I got, you know, preacher, you don't understand, my hangnail was bad. And I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. My hang, I was about to lose my whole fingernail. You say, preacher, I, I got a bad hangnail. Well, don't tell me. I didn't know. And you're here, so it must not have been that bad. What I'm saying is this. Man, there's something about being at the assembly. There's something about coming to the house of God. You know what I found out? I found out in the days to where I had to live stream. Now, I don't, I'm probably not going to finish. We'll finish next Wednesday night. 
Here's what I found out. In the, in the days when we had the live stream, my wife wanted to watch our service. I didn't want to watch it. You know why? I'd already heard the message. I just preached it about 45 minutes earlier. You not going to watch service with me? No. I don't know how y'all come. I don't like to hear me preach. So preacher, we don't either. We're waiting. But you know what I found out in live streaming? There's some, there's some guys that, I, that I, I really like to hear. I, I enjoyed Brother Harrison's message today. I sat in my office. I played the, I played the message, listened to it, and I laughed when he laughed, listened to, listened to the scriptures. That he, but you know what I done when he was finished? I cut the internet off and I went right back to what I was doing. There was no invitation time. There was no, I mean, I, I guess I had a reflection time while he was preaching. I thought, man, that was a good thought of this. But it's different than when the Spirit of God's working in the house of God. How, where do we get it? We get in the church. We get in the church house. One writer made this, and I'll, and I'll move on. One writer said this, What greater calamity can fall upon a nation than the loss of worship? We're seeing that. What greater calamity can fall upon a nation than the loss of worship? If you don't think Satan knows what he's doing with all this, you're blind. He knows exactly what he's doing. Let me give you this. What about our practice? I'm going, I'm going to finish it. i got six minutes. I'm going to finish it. What about our practices? He says, not forsaking, but then he says this, but exhorting one another. Exhorting one another. Webster's 1828 says this, of exhortation to encourage, to embolden, to cheer, to advise. The primary sense seems to be excite or to give strength, the spirit or courage, to incite by words or advice. Sounds a whole lot like that first provoking we talked about, to incite. How do we incite people? We do that through encouragement. We do that through edification. We do that through exhortation, but exhorting one another. To incite by words or advice, to animate or urge by arguments, to a good deed or to any laudable conduct or course of action. Years ago, long before my time, years ago before Brother Brent, Brother Josh had a job of installing HVAC systems in the whole house, they had fireplaces. I had to used to go cut wood, say, Preacher, do you want a wood burning stove? I do, but I want to put gas logs in it because I don't want to split any more wood. I'm tired of splitting wood, carrying wood, chopping wood, dumping it out of the wheelbarrow and restacking it. I'm tired of all that junk. Carrying the ashes out. Say, so who would do that? Well, my wife, I couldn't talk her into it. It'd be stuck with me. So gas logs it is. But they had these fireplaces all through the house. And they would take and, uh, you know, the kids' room may not have a fireplace. You know, they may not have that. So get cold overnight, you know, it wasn't like they had real good insulation, but they'd all, can you picture them all gathered around the living room under that one main fireplace? You know how kids are, maybe two or three youngins under one blanket. And you look in that fire, and, and in that fire, I, I'm from West Virginia. Y'all, y'all ever seen coal? Anybody in here ever seen coal? I know you've seen it, y'all lived on it. Coal. So how, what is coal? Coal burns hot. Coal is warm. I mean, you said, Paul, preacher, wood. Throw a couple lumps of coal on that. I'm telling you, it makes a difference, don't it? But you throw that coal in there, and you get it all in, 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 in piles. You get the wood and the coal, and it's all heaped up. And, and as that coal burns, you know what it does? It begins to, that black coal begins to burn red. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it begins to burn red. But as it burns, and you know, the cinders begin to burn down, one of those lumps may roll off of that pile. And when it gets separated from this other group in the middle, that one that was one time burning red hot will now begin to turn gray and gray and the fire will go out and it will begin to get cold. You take that coal and you put it back up in with the other ones. And then, and then as, as time goes on, if you just let those piles alone, nothing ever happens, they'll begin to burn out. Anybody know what a poker is? And you take that poker and you'll run that thing in that fireplace or into that, that wood burning stove and you'll kind of do one of them numbers. And you rustle all that, you begin to stir that, and all of a sudden that fire that was going down, that heat begins to consume it one more time, and it begins to build up, and there's warmth in the midst of that assembly. Oh, yes. You say, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, that's exactly how it works. This is how we put into practice. People begin to get cold. We exhort them, hey, get back in. Get back closer. Keep walking with God. Don't quit. Come back in here. And so those four, five, six 
Seven families that may be on fire for God may be able to reach that one that's discouraged or that one that's distraught or that one that's broken or that one that's hurt and to be able to wrap their arms because their motive is love, because their motive is they're provoking them unto good works and saying don't quit, don't give up, don't waver and they'll be able to go forward by exhortation. In closing, say preacher, you just don't understand the days just getting bad. It's not like it used to, it's not like it used to be. Let me give you this verse. Listen to this. It's just getting so bad, I think we're gonna to have to quit. It's just getting so bad, preacher. You just don't understand. I think we're gonna to have to quit. I think it'd just be best if we quit. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Look at this. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so much the more. You see, I wrote this down. I want to read it because I don't want to mess it up. How often do we hear it's getting worse and worse? It's getting worse and worse. And in so doing, we're seeing less and less emphasis on, on corporate worship. Worse and worse, but we're seeing less and less when the answer is more and more. That's what it says. And so much the more. You don't have to read Greek to, to get that. It means more. And so much the more, as you see that, so the closer we get to the day that's approaching, man, the more that we need to exhort one another, the more we need to encourage one another because the darker it gets in the world, hey, listen, the sooner Jesus is coming in His timeline and the darker it gets here, the more we're going to have to help each other, the more we're going to have to band together side by side. Listen, it's not the way it was in the 40s. It's not the way it was in the 50s. It's not the way it was in the 60s. It's not even the way it was in the, in the 80s. And my friend, it's a bit shame to say it's not even the way it was in the 90s. We're far past those days. I'm going to tell you, we need each other. If we're going to make it in this world, we're going to need all the help we can get. And God has put us here to get and to give the help that we're going to need to make it through this life. Would you stand with me tonight?